Hello and welcome everyone to Selectus presentation at the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. My name is Paul Deal and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Selecta in Mountain View, California. We're a small company that focuses on uh, research tools for functional genetic analysis and screening. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Barbara Nicky from Nuvasan Innovation Campus Berlin. Dr. Nicky is going to discuss phenotypic screening and hit target deconvolution using pooled CRISPR-Cas9 screening technology. I've known Dr. Nicky for several years. Um, before Nuvasan, she was working at Bayer uh, doing similar type of research. And I think you'll find uh, her presentation both interesting and informative. I hope so. And uh, after she's finished, I will give a short overview of uh, Selectus technology for functional uh, analysis not just a few slides, and then we will be happy to take any questions about uh, any of the um, technology or um, research that you've seen in during the presentation. With that, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Nikki and move on to the main presentation. Hello, everybody. I'd like to present our study that describes a successful target deconvolution strategy using pooled CRISPR-Cas9 knockout screening. In a high-throughput screening campaign with nearly 4 million compounds, we had identified a novel small molecule inhibitor of the oncogenic YAP-TAS pathway. And to understand the mode of action of the compound, we wanted to find its molecular target. I'm joined here by Jan Naujox, the scientist who headed the CRISPR screening project, and Martin Lange, the pharmacology lead of the program, originally conducted at Biopharma. All three of us are now working at the Nuvisan Innovation Campus, Berlin. Nuvisan is a fully integrated contract research organization. Last year, Nuvisan acquired a complete research unit from Bayer and founded the Innovation Campus Berlin. We have long-term pharmaceutical research experience and can provide you with knowledge on cutting-edge drug development, innovative research practice, and how to advance your project optimally towards your goal from the model to the patient. In our Nuvisan Innovation Campus Berlin Research Center, we have capabilities and capacities spanning the entire drug development value chain. From hypothesis generation to lead structure identification and optimization, from DMPK to pharmacology, from in vitro to in vivo. Thereby, we can provide you solutions for fully integrated turnkey projects, subprojects, as well as individual questions. The study we present here is a good example of the integrated research we do at the SCB. Here the aim was to identify modulators of the oncogenic YAPTAS pathway. YAPTAS are downstream regulators of the HIPPO pathway and additional cellular cues such as wind, GPCR and road GDPA signaling. They have been shown to be aberrantly activated oncogenes in several human solid cancers, resulting in enhanced cell proliferation, metastases, and provision of a pro tumorigenic and microenvironment. This makes YAPTAS attractive targets for novel cancer therapies. Yet, the development of effective inhibitors of these potent oncogenes has been challenging. With our work, we aim to identify novel inhibitors of YAPTAS activity by performing a phenotypic compound screen. As a screening system, we used MDA and B231 human breast cancer cells. These cells contain a loss of function mutation in NF2, which is an upstream component of the HIPPO signaling pathway. This mutation leads to a constitutive nuclear localization of YAP1-TAS, which causes an aberrant activation and a YAP-regulated expression of YAP1-TAS target genes. 
We modified these cells to express a Yapon tus dependent firefly luciferase reporter under the control of teat binding sites, we call teat luciferase, and a constitutively active TK vanilla luciferase reporter as of target control. For this cell system, we screened a library of 3.8 million small molecules to find compounds that selectively inhibit teat luciferase but not the TK vanilla luciferase. All the hits from this screen were then tested in a high content analysis screen for their ability to induce translocation of YAP1 from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. The remaining selected hits that were active in both assays were then assessed for their effects on endogenous yap one tas target gene expression. So we identified several small molecule compound classes one of them is represented by BAE 2506856. To understand the mode of action of this class of YAPTAS inhibitors, we set out to identify the molecular target of the compound. As one option to perform this so-called target deconvolution, there are a couple of publications that describe genetic perturbation screens to do so. We based our strategy on the assumption that our compound could inhibit T luciferase activity by either inhibition of a positive upstream regulator of yap one tas or by activation of a yap one tas upstream repressor. Now, we thought that target inhibition might be the more likely mode of action, and therefore we focused on this scenario. And, um, we hypothesize that without compound treatment, the target is active and teat luciferase activity is maximum. Now, treating the cells with our um, BAE 2506856 um, would then inactivate the target in a dose dependent manner, and then with um, the highest concentration of the compound causing the maximal target inhibition that could be measured with maximal teat luciferase reporter inhibition. So as a target screening strategy, we thought that if we treat cells with endogenous target gene expression within IC20 of our compound, we would detect an only slight reduction in T luciferase signal then. But if we induce a kind of target knockdown using CRISPR-Cas9 technology, we would then significantly lower the number of targetable molecules in the cell, and the same amount of compound would now cause maximal inhibition of the target and hence teeth reporter activity. So target knockdown, would sensitize the cells to compound treatment. Our idea was therefore to screen the very same screening cells that we had used in the compound screen for effects of target gene knockdown in combination with low dose compound treatment. How did we think we could achieve target knockdown using CRISPR-Cas9? Targeted cutting of double-stranded DNA by CRISPR-Cas9 and uses cellular non-homologous end-joining DNA repair mechanisms. These are not very accurate. They lead to a mixture of correctly repaired DNA, identical to the wild-type DNA, and, but also to in-frame and out-of-frame repair that results in indel mutations. In diploid or multiploid cells, these mutations can be homozygously affecting all alleles carrying the gene, or only affect the different alleles differently to the point that only one of the allele is affected while the other one is still intact. This is called a monoallelic alteration and will, under some circumstances, mean that significantly less of the target gene is expressed, causing a knockdown equivalent. Shown here on the right in the graph um, is that um, 
Michlitz et al. have shown in their Nature Methods publication that given an sgRNA library and uses an 80% frame shift rate, up to 30% of the cells might carry a heterozygous in their loss of function mutations. This data supported our idea to screen for compound effects on cells with target gene knockdown caused by CRISPR-induced monoallelic indel mutations. The key point of our screening idea was to develop a FUX-based readout that detects the effect of manipulating the T. luciferase reporter both by genetic and compound perturbations. Then we assumed that knocking down or chemically inactivating targets would give different luciferase signal intensities. However, only the right combination of drug target knockdown induced by CRISPR induced heterozygous mutation and RC20 compound treatment would cause a significant difference in signal between treated and untreated cells. This is depicted here in this flow cytometry histogram plot with the luciferase reporter intensity on the X and the cell count on the Y axis. We would expect that the cells with a homozygous knockout for the affected genes, here shown in yellow, or the target gene, here in green, would lose the luciferase reporter expression and thus would be enriched in the left part of this curve with the lowest reported expression. Cells with a heterozygous knockout for the effector's genes, however, or the drug target would be found somewhere towards the middle of this plot. Cells with perturbed unrelated genes would be distributed evenly under the curve. Consequently, as said before, the treatment with a compound will decrease the teat luciferase signal only in the cells with a heterozygous monoallelic mutation of the actual drug target. So this screen shows our final screening layout. We generated a MDA-MB231 teat luciferase cell clone that stably expresses Cas9 and that showed the same growth and assay properties as the compound screening cell line. We transduced these cells with a lentiviral sgRNA library at an MOI of 0.5, aiming for a final representation of 500 cells per sgRNA. Then we selected for sgRNA expression for seven days, after which we left one half of the cells untreated and treat the other half of the transduced cells with an IC20 of our compound for 24 hours. We then fax sorted the cell population for the 10% lowest and 10% highest luciferase expressing cells and performed NGS to detect the sgRNAs expressed in the respective cell populations. To calculate the effect of sgRNA expression and compound treatment on T. luciferase expression, we evaluate the full change between these conditions. As mentioned before, the first crucial step in setting up the target deconvolution screen was to establish the fax-based readout detecting luciferase protein expression. As shown here, using a rabbit monoclonal anti-firefly luciferase antibody from APCAM, we were able to nicely separate firefly luciferase expressing cells from cells not expressing the construct at all, or mixing, expressing, and not expressing cells. More importantly, we could show that our PAX-based luciferase detection system was as sensitive in detecting the effects of Bay 2506856 induced dose-dependent inhibition of the teat luciferase signal as the assays used to identify the compound in the first place. Shown here on the left, using the MDAMB231 teat luciferase cells, our compound inhibits teat luciferase activity with an IC50 of 56 nanomole and has no effect on TK vanilla luciferase signal. 
Moreover, high content analysis assays showed that the Bay compound effectively inactivates YAP1 by inducing translocation to the cytoplasm with an IC50 of 15 nano. In the fax based assay, uh, the T luciferase expression is inhibited by the compound with an IC50 of 61 nanomo, almost identical to the IC50 in the luciferase activity assay. Getting these results, we moved ahead and generated Cas9 overexpressing MDA MB231 T luciferase cell clones. We tested them for their growth properties and assay window and chose one of the clones to perform the screen with. As a screening library, we choose Selectas Pooled Human Genome Wide Knockout sgRNA library. This library consists of three modules, each targeting approximately a third of the genome using eight sgRNAs per gene, plus 200 negative and positive screening control sgRNAs. This comprises up to 50,000 sgRNAs per module. We started with module two, which targets about 6,000 human genes, especially additional disease-associated genes and drug targets. It has the highest overlap with known YAPTAS modulators. Very importantly, we spiked in ASGRNA, targeting specifically our Firefly luciferase readout as a positive control of the screening assay. This slide depicts the results of the CRISPR screen. Shown are the mean fold changes of sgRNAs detected for a given target in the low expressing 10% versus high expressing 10% bin, in the control cells on the y axis versus the compound treated samples on the x axis. Important to notice here is that the sgRNA targeting the assay readout luciferase scores highest under both treatment conditions. So depletion of luciferase means uh, an increase of sgRNAs in the low 10% bin. Furthermore, known mediators or activators of YAPTAS activity are also being identified to significantly downregulate luciferase protein expression independently of treatment, namely NA12, ACTR2, ACTR3, RAC1, and TEAT1. The exciting outcome of this screen was that we found PGT1B to be markedly enriched in the luciferase low population of the untreated cell pool, indicating that attenuating endogenous PGT1B levels via CRISPR-Cas9 inhibits cellular TEAT activity. But even more interesting was that uh, the treatment with an IC20 concentration of our Bay inhibitor further enhanced the enrichment in the luciferase low population only in cells targeted by PGT1B sgRNAs. So this indicated that the attenuation of endogenous PGT1B levels using sgRNAs sensitize these cells to Bay2506856 and therefore that PGT1B might be the molecular target of the compound. We then uh, wanted to verify the screening results. So we screened the cells again using small libraries of SG, but also as HRNAs in both pooled and arrayed formats, targeting just um, 75 known yep, one task regulators, including PGT1B. With uh, 10 SG or SHRNAs per target, the pooled libraries had an even higher complexity than the screening library. The array screen was to test more specifically if the assay window seen in the pool screen could be improved. All three approaches, as you can see here, uh, supported the screen result that PGT1B is the possible target of Bay2506856. The 
further validate these results, we tested the effects of individual SGRNAs against PGT1B. Shown on the right is a Western plot analysis that uh, shows that two individual sgRNAs significantly reduce PGT1B expression in a pool of transduced cells. Now, measuring luciferase activity instead of protein expression, we could show that PGT1B knockout decreased luciferase activity and that this effect was even stronger when the cells were treated with an IC20 of our compound decreasing there by the IC50 by 50%. So knockout or knockdown of PGT1B sensitizes MDAMB231 cells to Bay 2506A56 treatment. As an alternative method to identify the direct target of Bay 2506A56, Pelago Bioscience AB performed proteome-wide cellular thermal shift assays combined with mass spectrometry, called SETSMS. SETSMS allows for the identification of direct binding partners of small molecules. Again, also these studies identified PGT1B as a top-ranked hit for direct binding of Bay 2506856 and using a strong shift in the melting temperature of PGT1B between the control treatment here shown in blue and the compound treatment shown in red. Furthermore, in a biochemical assay, compound mediated inhibition of enzymatic activity of purified human journal general transferase 1 was measured using the beta subunit of the human GGTAs and the alpha subunit of the human fornicyl transferase to constitute the functional GGTAs 1 complex. This is here showing on the right. So alternative methods also confirm PGT1B as a target of Bay 2506856. Summarizing the data, we showed that we identified Bay 2506856 as a small molecule with potent anti yeptas activity. In the same screening cell system that was used for the high throughput screen, we performed a pool CRISPR screen to identify the molecular target of the compound using module 2 of Selectors pooled human genome wide knockouts sgRNA library. In this CRISPR screen, PGT1B was found as the direct target of the compound. Applying various complementary CRISPR, RNAi, and functional assays, we confirmed PGT1B as the direct target of the compound. And with this, I'd like to thank especially our then master student, Julian Kühlens, for her perseverance in setting up and help to run the CRISPR screens and all our other colleagues from the ICB for their contributions to the project. Last but not least, I'd like to thank Selecta and especially Paul Deal for giving us the opportunity to present this work here at the AAPS National Biotech Conference. And Paul will now give an overview of Selecta's uh, technologies, after which we will then uh, be available to take questions. Thank you very much for your interest and your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Deal, Chief Operating Officer at Selecta. And I'd like to take a few minutes to give you an overview of the tools and technology that we offer for um, gene functional analysis and, and genetic screening. Selecta started about uh, 13, 14 years ago um, with seed money from research grants. We're not a venture funded company. And um, we're really focused on technology development and specifically um, techniques to identify genes responsible for disease progression, uh, drug resistance, cell differentiation development, uh, and other biological uh, phenotypic uh, responses or biological processes um, that are um, of interest to researchers looking at different cell and animal models. And the, um, the 
uh, focus is not to look at individual one gene at a time, but really to look at large numbers of uh, genes and be able to identify then the specific ones that are important for these uh, responses. Uh, you know, disease progression and understand what are the underlying genes that are uh, driving that pro progression, which ones might be good for um, therapeutic uh, targeting, etc. And uh, rather than focus on uh, developing tools for laboratories that have large scale automation and have industrial types of approaches to be able to do large numbers of assays, microtiter plates at a time, or um, you know, limb systems to manage a lot of different data. We really wanted to focus more on um, standard molecular and cell biology laboratories that have access to um, uh, those you know, standard techniques um, and be able to run them using cell culture and and, and uh, molecular biology reactions, uh, reagents that are available generally. Uh, what has enabled us to be able to do that and uh, many other labs uh, is the rapid development of uh, next generation sequencing technology in the past uh, 15 years or so. Um, the ability then with next generation sequencing knowledge, uh, technology in parallel has been, has come along the ability to deconvolute uh, results from complex biological assays and simultaneously look at thousands of different elements in parallel. And so using NGS as a readout, um, it makes it possible to pull out results from thousands of individual reactions at once and track changes in multiple samples um, all in one single type of readout. And we've had some success with this approach. Uh, here are a handful of publications, and we have, I think, uh, about 300 some or more on our site at this point. Uh, you can see the link at the bottom if you want a more comprehensive list. Um, but these are different groups that we've worked with that have cited us or that we've had collaborations with or, um, uh, you know, have... Um, uh, uh, had services done by us. And so uh, on that website at the bottom, there is a search function. And so um, you can use that maybe to find if you're interested in particular applications or cell systems or procedures that you want to focus on, you may be able to find relevant publications um, that uh, would help you, um, you know, set up your experiments or your studies. The first technology I'd like to talk a little bit about is the driver map expression profiling assay. This platform uh, enables you to get data on genes that are activated or deactivated in samples, um, in you know, cell or animal samples, uh, in response to different treatments from different animals, from different patients, if you're looking at biopsies, um, etc. Uh, and the standard approach to do this sort of uh, analysis on a genome-wide basis is RNA sequencing. And RNA sequencing is certainly a very powerful approach, um, but RNA sequencing is somewhat com technically complex. With RNA sequencing, you're doing a reverse transcription of the entire transcriptome, um, all of the, the genes, fragmenting the, the cDNA resulting from that, sequencing everything, and then at the end, trying to deconvolute all of that data to understand which genes are more highly expressed or present in the RNA than, uh, you know, which transcripts are more highly present in the um, RNA than others. And so um, this is an alternative to that. Uh, the uh, other approach that's very common, but only really works for a small number of genes, but is sort of the gold standard, is uh, QRT-PCR, where you're looking at uh, targeted amplification of specific transcripts um, from a small number of genes, and then um, analyzing the results of that to understand ex expression changes uh, in different samples. And that really gives you uh, more um, precise data in, in some ways than uh, RNA sequencing. So what we try to do is combine both RNA sequencing, um, sorry, uh, QRT-PCR with sort of the genome-wide approach of RNA sequencing. And um, to do that, what we did is we developed a set of 38,000 primers that amp amplify a specific 80 to 200 nucleotide segment of the RNA from each protein coding gene in the human genome. So you're looking at 19,000 protein coding genes. We have 38,000 primers. But the point is that all of these work in a single multiplex reaction. And so you're really doing just a single RT-PCR reaction. On total RNA, you don't have to use uh, uh, mRNA. There's no reason for enrichment of mRNA because it's a targeted reaction, and these are specific primers. 
And then you have 19,000 amplicons resulting from that, all of which can easily be sequenced on an Illumina sequencer because 19,000 is much less complicated than a complete fragmented copy of the whole transcriptome. And so as a result, um, what you find is that with the driver map approach, um, with 5 million reads, we're able to get better sensitivity in terms of uh, low number, uh, low copy transcripts um, than you are with RNA-seq with 25 to 50 million reads. So, so the technique is very sensitive in, the, in that respect. And again, um, you only have to isolate total RNA, so uh, you can use this approach for very small samples. Uh, and since it is PCR-based uh, the, with the amplification, um, you can get um, a product from even single cells, as shown here. These are JERCAT and HEK293 cells that were fact sorted. And then uh, we did uh, a single cell in each well, in, um, and then went through and uh, ran the driver map technique. And then we were able to identify uh, marker genes in uh, all of these wells. Um, it, we were able to identify and separate what are JERCAT cells and what are the um, HEK293 cells in the plate um, pretty readily um, using the profiles that obtained from these single cells. And so we routinely then run samples with uh, low numbers of cells. Uh, sometimes uh, biopsies can, you know, be, have very small numbers, uh, very small amounts of material, and we get complete profiles from these small samples. The other thing is it is a um, more uh, easier technique. Um, the uh, driver map technique can be run, uh, again, with total RNA, and since it's just a single tube reaction um, and there's really no transfers involved, you just continue to add the material to do the reverse transcriptase and then the reagents to do reverse transcriptase and then um, the uh, PCR. And then um, there is one change at uh, the end where you have to do a second PCR to add the primers, the P5 and the P7 primers for sequencing. But really all of that can be done in a day easily for a um, uh, you know, 96 well plate. And then sequence overnight and then the next day you have your results because again, you're looking at specific amplicons uh, that uh, have reference sequences. So the um, analysis is really just taking the NGS results and aligning them to the amplicons that you um, know that you've targeted. It's different than having to align to the whole genome and getting different overlapping fragments and then trying to interpret which of those is actually corresponding to a certain expression level of the gene and how does that compare with other samples. So the analysis can be done really on a spreadsheet. So driver map and other expression profiling technologies actually um, provide an understanding of which genes are up or down regulated. However, um, transcriptome analysis doesn't really tell you which genes are driving a specific phenotype, which, what activated or deactivated genes actually cause the biology that you're looking at. Because if you're looking for a drug target, you don't want sort of the marker gene, you want the, the gene that's actually driving the biology. For that type of analysis, uh, you really need to have a technology that disrupts or perturbs the target, gene, uh, target genes in your sample. And then you can see how that changes the response of your uh, model, how that changes the response of the cells. And really the only two technologies that enable this sort of gene disruption analysis to be done on sort of large scale with over across thousands of genes or genome wide are um, CRISPR and RNAi. Both of these technologies enable you then to um, look at a database of gene sequences and make a set of short RNA make a set of short RNA reagents such as shRNA or with CRISPR of course sgRNA um, that targets the genome. But each of these then will disrupt or somehow perturb the targets that you're looking at, and then from there you can see um, when you're looking at a particular phenotype which are the ones that are important for the response that you're looking at. For pool screening with uh, CRISPR or shRNA, the approach is pretty much the same uh, for any type of uh, response that you're looking at. Um, and there are a couple different ways you can do the actual screen. But in all cases, uh, you uh, develop a set of oligonucleotides that encode uh, sgRNA for CRISPR, for example, and then clone these into a lentiviral vector. And then um, Take the lentiviral library now that you have that targets thousands of genes, maybe genome-wide 19,000 with 80,000 constructs, which are um, you know one of the libraries that we sell off the shelf. 
package these as lentiviral particles, and then introduce them into a population of cells. You transduce them into the cells such that most of the cells in the population get one sgRNA that targets one particular gene. And then you can look at a number of different responses in those cells and see which of the sgRNA are affecting the cell response. So the most common approach is really uh, to look for genes that are essential under certain growth conditions. And for this, what happens is um, you allow the cells to grow for a period of time, and then you compare the, uh, isolate the genomic DNA, uh, amplify and, and uh, isolate the sgRNA that's in the uh, whole cell population by sequencing analyze the representation of each sgRNA and compare that to the original library. And what you're looking for are genes that are, sorry, are guides that are depleted because when they're depleted or underrepresented in the population after two or three weeks of growth compared to initially in the population, that indicates that they're toxic to the cells. And presumably the guides are toxic to the cells because of the genes they're targeting and knocking out are essential. And so in this way, you can identify, for example, genes that are required for growth of certain types of cancers or tumors. Um, you can also uh, you know, use this approach to understand what genes are causing resistance of particular, um, uh, to particular drugs by having the cells grow in the presence of the drug and then looking for genes that are specifically essential um, when uh, the cells are in that, um, grown in that drug. And so that's just one type of screen. Um, there are, of course, other types of approaches, uh, other types of screens. You can try and kill all the cells and do a rescue screen and see if you knock out certain um, uh, genes, for example, are you not getting the response of a treatment or factor that you're um, giving to the cells that would indicate that a certain pathway needs to be active for the cells to be susceptible to that. Um, also, um, you know, there's uh, facts-based screens where you can look for activation of a reporter, etc. So there are a number of different ways to apply this. And then finally, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about um, the fact that the technology that we use to make the sgRNA and shRNA libraries um, and uh, run screens like that can also be used with some cloning tricks to insert other types of oligos into uh, lentiviral systems. And in particular, you can do this where you have large numbers of um, oligos with unique sequences that can be cloned into a lentiviral construct and then um, introduced into cells to um, label individually each one of the cells in a population. And with some cloning tricks, you can do this and get a million, several million, 50 million different um, unique barcodes that are um, clearly defined so that you know what you're looking for when you do the sequencing. Um, then this isn't random synthesis of, of just random oligos, um, uniquely defined and then introduce those into a population. And then they can be used um, to create a founder population that as they propagate, you can use to track um, cells that um, uh, you know, uh, are differentiating, um, cells that differentiate into certain uh, different populations under conditions, um, uh, responses to cells and drug treatments, et cetera. So uh, an example here, for example, is uh, from a study that MD Anderson did um, to look at cell heterogeneity and subpools in a population. And what they did is they introduced a barcoded library into a, popul a PDX population, and then continued to propagate that multiple times until they got a stable um, set of cells that had, um, uh, I forget how many, it was uh, tens of thousands of different barcodes. But so there were subpopulations in this large population um, it, with different barcodes that they could look at the heterogeneity. And it was relatively stable as they um, propagated it multiple times but then they could treat it with various drugs and see how um, drug resistance, how they responded and how uh, different type of, types of, um, uh, how the cells responded to treatment from different types of drugs in terms of the recovery and how different subpopulations may have recovered with one drug versus another one, et cetera. And so you can look at the um, study in uh, the citation at the bottom of the slide um, if you wanna look at that in more detail. And another example here is a group that we um, were working with from Stanford that formed a company called D2G. And in this case, they had a small library of sgRNA and combined that with barcoding. And so for each of these sgRNA that are targeting uh, different uh, tumor suppression uh, genes, such as p53 or ATM or um, RB1, um, they uh, combined it with several hundreds of thousands of barcodes, not several, but hundreds of thousands of barcodes 
So you have uh, multiple versions of, say, the P53 sgRNA. It's all the same sgRNA, but it's linked to a different barcode each time. So now when that's introduced into the animal, and this is an aerosol model, so the animal just breathes in the uh, lentiviral library and then affects the cells of the lungs. Um, they can, after uh, you know a month or two, isolate the lung tissue, uh, do sequencing, and be able to tell how many different infections they're getting of a particular um, uh, tumor, uh, an sgRNA targeting a particular tumor suppressor factor. And then based on the number of reads they're getting for that barcode sgRNA combination, they can tell the size of the tumor. And so with this one animal then, um, in this animal model, they can uh, actually analyze multiple different uh, responses to different sgRNA. And then of course, look at the um, effect of drugs on these type of um, tumors. And so they're doing sort of a genotyping of uh, multiple different types of tumors tumors in the same animal. And again, the reference is at the bottom of the page. And so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate um, you giving me a few moments to uh, present some of the work that we've been doing. And uh, we will move on then to the question section of the presentation. So uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'd be happy to try and address them for you. Thank you.